Hi there guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks so much for joining me. Now in this video, what we're going to be looking at is the second in our video is all about the research process in psychology. And this one is all about populations and samples. Now psychology, of course, is primarily a subject to do with human beings and human behaviour. So if we're going to do any experiments, if we're going to want to know anything at all, then we're going to need some humans to do some experiments with. Where do we get those humans from? And what are the pros and cons of different methods of sampling? That's what we're going to be looking at in this video. So let's dive straight in. The first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is a sample? This is quite simple. The people that a psychology researcher studies are collectively known as a sample. We take a sample of people and we work on those people. Now, the sample is drawn from a larger group known as a population. Now, the thing about this word population, to a layman, a population is all the people in a particular group. You talk about the population of London or even the population of planet Earth. In this case, the population doesn't have to mean the entire population of the country or, or the world or whatever it is. The term can actually refer to any specific group such as workers or students, pensioners, maybe the unemployed, maybe the members of a specific religion, whatever you want. The population that a particular study is interested in is called the target population. So, for example, workers or students. The sampling means that we select people to take part in our research. There are two, well, pretty much logical steps behind this. First thing we have to do is define the target population that we want to study. Perhaps we, let's say we live in Dundee, poor you, and you want to do a survey on elderly people. Now, unless that target population is very small, probably you can't study all of the elderly people in Dundee. There's going to be quite a lot of them. So therefore, what we have to do is pick a smaller group from that population, the sample in this case, and we conduct the research on them. So what should a good sample be then? Ideally, our sample should be three things. It should be representative, it should be unbiased, and it should ideally be large. So being representative means that the sample should contain the same mix of people and behaviours as was initially found in the target population. Same religion, same working, same mixture of males and females, all those kind of things. However, this is less likely to happen if our sample is biased. And what we mean by that is if the sample is distorted by having too many or even too few people from certain groups within the target population. So, for example, if our target population is, let's say, people in their 20s, and you obtained your sample from a university library, well, chances are the sample is going to be incredibly biased by having lots of students there. And what that means is very few people from other occupations. All you're really going to get is student behaviour and nothing else. So it's biased. Now, a large sample is always better. Having a larger sample helps to even out random errors and stops our results being distorted by tiny little individual differences among our participants. Now, there's no perfect or ideal size for a sample, but generally speaking, the larger, the better. Now, if you have studied something apart from psychology, let's say a uh, Geography is probably a good example, something like that. Uh, and you've collected rock samples, or maybe geographers would do that, I don't know. Then the concept of sampling should be pretty logically similar to you. So rather than taking the whole rock or the whole mountain or whatever it is you're working from, you collect a small piece of it and you study that instead. Now the problems here are also similar. Because what if the area of the mountain that you're working from, in the area that you collected the rock sample from, say, just so happened to have a different type of rock than the other 99% of the mountain. And the problem is that the sample is not representative of the whole. And so the results of the study on that rock sample can't be generalised to the whole mountain because it's different by definition. And it's a very similar problem in psychology. psychology sorry. Imagine we want to conduct research into elderly people in the UK. If you selected a sample of elderly people by asking just your granny's friends, 
Well, they might not be representative of the whole population of elderly people in the UK. Perhaps they're in better health, um, they might be better educated than the average person, the average elderly person. Perhaps they're not as ethnically diverse as the whole population. So if your sample is not representative of the whole population, then what you find out about that sample is probably not able to be generalised. And this makes our entire research less valid. So how on earth do we get a sample which is representative, unbiased, large, and is able to be generalised to the entire population? Turns out there are six different things that we can do. And we're going to very briefly run through each of these just now. The first thing we can do, and probably the easiest thing that we can do, is something called opportunity sampling. This is simply put, a sample chosen by convenience. You just ask who's nearby at the time. So you guys will know all about this when you do your own psychology research project in your dissertation. Probably, chances are, you just ask the people that you know, your friends in the rest of the sixth year. Or you might ask a stranger walking by. This picture here, we've got someone leaning out the window and just shouting out their question to somebody that's walking by, walking their dog. Opportunity sampling. It's a sample of convenience. Now, the strength of this is that it's usually the quickest and easiest method. You just work with whoever you've got nearby. Pretty straightforward. However, this has lots of downsides to it. It suffers hugely from bias both in the population, so some members of the population are going to be underrepresented simply because they weren't walking by at that particular time. And as well as that, the researchers themselves might also bias their selection. Take you guys, for example. You are more likely to go and talk to your friends and ask for their help rather than somebody you don't know. That's just human nature. But if you just talk to your friends, then that is not a representative sample. That is a completely biased sample. Your friends might not be the same as the rest of the target members of that population. So you have to be careful with opportunity sampling. The next is something called random sampling. The picture here should tell you all you need to know about random sampling. Random sampling is all about everyone in the population having an equal chance of being included in the sample. Now, you could do this with names out of a hat. You put the entire population into the hat and then draw names at random. But if you've got a population that, let's say, is a million people long, that's going to be a pretty big hat and it's going to take you a pretty long time. So normally what psychologists do is use random number software instead. It's a much faster and easier way of doing that. Strengths to random sampling? Well, it's the best way of ensuring a representative sample. All you're going to get is a completely random sample. Lots of different people, no bias there whatsoever. However, the thing about random sampling is it's incredibly time consuming. Imagine taking all those names and putting them into your software and then choosing them and then contacting them and then asking them if they want to take part in your study or your survey, whatever it is. It's going to take ages. And as well as that, there's no guarantee that these people are going to say yes. Imagine you sitting there just now, suddenly your phone rings. Hello, I'm a psychologist from such and such a university. I've got this study. It's going to take two hours of your time. Do you fancy it? Probably not. You know, it's not everybody that wants to take part in these studies. So it's not even guaranteed you're going to get a study done at all. Again, you have to be a bit careful. The third is something called self-selecting sampling. This is sometimes called volunteer sampling. In this one, all you do is you ask people by an advert, perhaps by an email, TV advert, something like that, if they wouldn't mind taking part in your study. And then people volunteer themselves to be part of your study. The image that you're seeing there on the right hand side of the screen, that's actually from Stanley Milgram's 1963 study into obedience. Now you can see he's been a bit naughty there because he says that it's a study into memory, whereas we know that it was a study into all sorts of horrendous things, but that is self-selecting sampling. What's good about self-selection is it's a very simple way to get a very large number of participants. We tend to find that people want to take part, especially if you pay them for their time. And as well as that, unless given your Stanley Milgram, it's pretty much ethically sound because these people know what they're volunteering for. You're not forcing them into anything. These people will want to take part. The downsides to this, however, is that volunteers are, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, ab 
normal. People that volunteer for things like psychology surveys and studies and things, they tend to be very high up in pro-social behaviour. They're less likely to be like the rest of the members of the target population. These people are a little bit outside the norm. So we can't really rely on them to get a, a true representative generalize, generalizable sorry, sample. As well as that, we have to be careful where we place our advert as well. Because again, if we place it in, let's say, a university library, then chances are, are we're going to get our students. If we place it in something like um, a particular newspaper, then we're only really going to get the people that read that newspaper and not people of different political or social opinions. So again, we have to be careful. The fourth method is something called systematic sampling. Systematic sampling is all about picking people at fixed intervals from the list of the whole population. So in our little diagram here, what we've got is a list of 12 people. That's the population. What we've done here is we've taken every third person. We've used a system to select our sample. Now, systematic sampling is quite an interesting one because it generally gives us a very representative sample. You can see here there are more red people in this population than there are anybody else. Well, it just so happens in our sample we have more red people than everybody else. That is a representative sample. It avoids researcher bias. There is no way of us kind of changing that sample there. It has to be those people. There's no way we can get around that. And it avoids self-selecting biases as well. We tend not to have volunteer problems here. These people who are a little bit abnormal, we get people simply because they were the third or the 20th person on the list. The thing about systematic sampling, however, is that the list that we chose to work from might be incomplete. Sometimes psychologists would use the electoral register. Well, it's not everybody that signed up to vote on the electoral register. You should be. It's a really good thing to do, but it's not everybody that does that. So you might find that your population is incomplete. Again, that's going to lead to a few problems further down the line. Stratified sampling is a kind of partial sampling method. It's a bit of a weird one, this one. Stratified sampling is all about making sure that key groups in your population are represented fairly in the sample. What do we mean by that? Let's have a look at this picture here. In the target population, it looks like we've got three people who are blue, three who are green, and six who are red. It doesn't matter what the colours mean, it could be religion, it could be gender, it could be occupation, doesn't really matter. We need to make sure that our sample roughly represents the proportion of different people in our target population. So because there are twice as many reds as there are any other colour in our population, then we make sure that our sample has twice as many reds as any other colour in the population. Sounds pretty straightforward, hopefully. What are the upsides to the stratified sampling? Well, it makes a sample more representative in terms of key variables. For example, gender, religion, ethnic background, you name it. If you choose it and you get those proportions, you can make sure it's representative. However, logically, the flip side of that is if we're making it representative in terms of some key variables, gender or religion, then it's going to be, by definition, unrepresentative in other ways, for example, occupation. So we have to be really careful. As well as that, it's not a complete method. It has to be combined with another method. So, for example, if we decide to pick 12 males and 12 females because we have an exact 50-50 gender split in our population, well, then we still have to actually get those people. So we still have to use one of the other methods to get them in the first place. And that, of course, leads to all the downsides of that other sampling, um, sampling strategy. We have to be really, really careful with this one. The last one that we look at is quota sampling. Quota sampling is kind of similar to stratified sampling. But here what we do is we make sure that we've specified numbers of participants from the key groups and categories, and then we fill that quota. So this means that let's say we are doing a, a survey on different religions in the United Kingdom. Now there are lots of different religions in the United Kingdom, Christianity being the main one, closely followed by people of no faith, um, Muslim comes next, then Hindu, and so on and so on and so on. Now if we did any of the other sampling methods, then we might find we are looking for a long, long time until we find a Sikh 
Or we might find we're waiting rather for a long, long time until we find a Buddhist. But if we use quota sampling, then we say, okay, we need three Christians, three Muslims, three Buddhists, three Jews, etc., 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 then we fill those quotas. Why are we doing that? Well, we're helping to ensure small minority groups are represented within a sample, especially if our study is about those particular minority groups. However, the flip side of this, however, is that proportions of small groups are distorted. There are very, very few comparatively Buddhists in the United Kingdom, kingdom compared to other religions. If we are artificially increasing the amount of Buddhists in our sample, it's going to lead to an unrepresentative conclusion. So again, we have to be careful. And as well as that, similar to stratify sampling, this isn't a complete method. We have to combine it with one of the others as well. Key concepts here, guys, we've got the six different types of sampling strategy. Opportunity, random self-selection, systematic, stratified, and quota. If you can understand these six different types of sampling and know how to apply them to your psychology research, then we're off to a winner. That's everything for this video, guys. Thanks so much again for watching. I hope you learned a little something. In our next video, we're going to be looking at the experimental method. So until then, guys, hope you're well. Take it easy and we'll see you next time. Cheers.